In this video, I'm going to go through an analysis of PepsiCo's financial statements. And this is the second video uh, for topic three for BU 381 for the fall 2019 semester. Um, I put out online for you an Excel workbook entitled PepsiCo Inc. Financials for Topic 3. Yours doesn't say my copy. This is uh, the copy I'm going to use because I'll make notes on it as I go through the different uh, portions of the financial statements here for Pepsi. Um, you can see here there's tabs down at the bottom. The first tab is the income statement for Pepsi. And so what I've done here is I've got the income statements for the past five years. The balance sheet, same thing, last five years, uh, year-end balance sheets. Statement of cash flows, again, the last five years of those. The ratios, and I created this page from the information uh, from Capital IQ. I've calculated the different ratios with the exception of these first two. Um, I used the ones that they had from Capital IQ but they're calculated the same way we would normally calculate those and then the rest of these I use the equations from the notes that are provided for topic uh, three and I just went through here and I calculated all the different ones for the five-year period uh, for each of the topics that we covered uh, with with one exception here uh, with the price to earnings, price to cash flow, and market to book ratio. These are actually calculated by Capital IQ. Um, the reason why I use their calculations is because they had to, they, they looked at the prices on those dates and calculated these values for them. Um, two other tabs here. So these are the financial statements down below. Here's the ratios from our notes. And then there's two other uh, topics here that I want to go over uh, some, somewhat quickly. Uh, the next one is segments, and this is out on Capital IQ, and you can actually uh, download these, and, and I'll actually show you how to do that at the end of this video. But I like this because it shows us where their revenues and their operating profit and assets and depreciation, amortization, and capital structure is divided up amongst the different areas that they operate in. And so here we can see that We've got Frito-Lay North America, Quaker Foods North America, PepsiCo Beverages North America, all of their sales from Latin America, all of their sales from Europe, and then Asia, Middle East, and North Africa. So we can see where all their revenues are coming from. And the same is true for their operating profit in these other areas that, that I mentioned before. And then we they just break down based on geographic segments. So you can see here that most of Pepsi's business comes from the United States. However, they do have a worldwide presence. And so a good portion of their revenues comes from overseas. So currently or in the last full fiscal year, 57.45% of their income came from the United States or excuse me, not income revenues, came from the United States, and the remaining 42.55% uh, came from overseas or internationally. Um, I like this because we can see the degree to which Frito-Lay North America, so in other words, the snack foods uh, from Frito-Lay make up their total revenues. So just Frito-Lay North America makes up 25.28% of Pepsi's total revenue. So that's quite a chunk of their business comes from just Frito-Lay in North America. And I mentioned in the previous video that they're dissimilar. Pepsi is dissimilar from Coca-Cola because they generate revenues and they generate profits from areas other than beverages. Um, we can see that again here, operating profit, and this is uh, really kind of a, a big deal here. Uh, operating profit, half of their operating profit, or 49.53%, came from Frito-Lay North America in the last year. So, um, and, and if you look at the numbers here, in general, with the exception of 2015, it was actually higher than than uh, half, more than half of their revenues came from Frito-Lay. But in general, the percentage of their revenues coming from Frito-Lay is increasing over time. Okay. Um, 
And so again, it's important to notice that when we analyze the company because we have to recognize that a large portion of their revenues, a large portion of their oper operating profit actually comes from somewhere other than beverages, which has historically been their main product. Um, and it's bec they're becoming more and more dependent upon uh, snack foods from Frito-Lay and from Quaker Foods as uh, for their, their operating income and their revenues. I mentioned in the last video as well common size financial statements. I talked about both income statements and, and balance sheets. As an analyst, I paid a lot of attention to the income statement, the common size income statement, because it was important to look at to get these, the idea of where their costs were coming from and, and, and what was affecting their margins. So I'm going to bounce over here to the income statement and just to take a look and to see what the trends are looking like with their revenues. So we can see here that between 2014 and 2016, their sales were actually falling and that's a pretty bad sign for a mature company like Pepsi. Their, their, their ability to sell more and more goods was going down. And understand too that revenues also are affected by inflation. So if their level of sales, their level of unit sales is saying the same, because of inflation, because their prices go up over time, their revenues should actually increase even if their units sold stay the same over time. So what this meant is that their, their number of units sold was actually decreasing during this time because their revenue was also decreasing. Again, not a great sign for a business when you're able to sell fewer units than you were the year before. We see an increase here from 2016 to 2017. I'm just gonna calculate it really quick. We saw an increase of 1.16%, so less than the rate of inflation. And then again for 2018, we saw great growth in revenues of 1.78%, getting close to the rate of inflation. Historically, the rate of inflation has been about 2% a year. So even though revenues are growing over these two years, it's not a great sign because they're not growing by more than the rate of inflation over those two year over that two-year period either. So that's a little bit of a warning sign for Pepsi. Uh, at least they've turned around this trend of decreasing revenues. Uh, things appear to be picking up in some areas for them, so that's a positive thing. But let's go back to the common sized income statement. So the nice thing about the common sized income statement is that it scales the um, cost of goods sold by the amount of revenue. So we can see what their margins look like on their on their um, on the products that they're selling. So here we see a trend that the cost of goods sold as a percentage of revenues decreased for this two th the period 2014 through 2016 by almost 2%. That may not sound by, like a lot, but that actually has a fairly large impact on the overall net income of the firm um, if you're able to decrease your cost of goods sold as a percentage of revenues. So while revenues were declining during this period of time, their cost of goods sold went down even more. And that what, what happened is that generated a fairly stable um, gross profit margin or gross profit sorry amount we did see a little drop here so we saw the the gross profit for the firm drop by 2.44 percent between 2014 and 2016 but then it started going up uh, up again. The total gross profit started going back up again. And the um, gross profit margin increased between 2014 and 2016. So even though revenues were falling, the gross profit margin was increasing. And then, it's, and then it kind of decreased and has been stable for the last two years. So that's a number that for, for companies that make goods and sell them, uh, a number that we pay cl close attention to because if, if their cost of the making or buying the products that they sell go up, that can have a, a, a fairly large impact on the cash flows of the firm and also the, the net profit of the firm. 
Other things that you can look at here are the selling general and administrative expenses as a percentage of sales. So if management is doing a good job of controlling these costs, like their cost of their you know payroll for their executives and administering the company, this is something that managers have a lot of control over. And, and Pepsi has been doing a fairly good job of controlling this over time. Um, they've gone through 37.92% down to about close to 37%. So they dropped that over the last five years. And so what that does is it increases, again, it increases the overall profitability of the firm. Operating income has increased over the last five years. It's gone from 15.1% to 16.43. It's been fairly stable these last two years. So again, that's a positive sign that uh, management is is getting control and, and has some control over uh, expenses and they're able to uh, increase their profitability based on that down below here things get a little weird um, their net income or net income margin has gone from 9.77 percent they it fell in 2015 to 8.65 went up to 10.08, went down again to 7.65, and then finally went up to 19.35. This number looks strange. So we have a, a mature firm in a mature industry, and it's got a, a fairly high net profit margin that is out of line with previous years. So I looked in the notes to the financial statements for Pepsi to see where this was coming from. It is coming from right here. Um, the income tax expense, which may sound weird. So what, what actually happened was that kind of in, in, to put it in layman's terms, they recategorized some overseas assets and were able to recognize an income tax benefit uh, from those recategorizing those those assets overseas. Um, there's, there's much more detail in the notes of the financial statements about this. But that's why they had a negative income tax expense in this year, even though they had positive income, at least according to their financial statements. So this was kind of a one-time thing. If we were analyzing Pepsi and we were extending this out into the future and determining what we would expect for the future, we wouldn't include this number. We would change this to be more in line with what they've done in the past um, because this is due to a one-time event. All right, so we've kind of gone through briefly segments. I wanted to show you this common size income statement. Again, everything on here, if you look at the equations, they're divided by the total income or total revenue for the firm for that year. If we had a balance sheet, a common size balance sheet, it would be every item for within the year would be divided by total assets. As an analyst, I didn't find that the uh, common size balance sheet was terribly useful. Um, a lot of that information we would look for would actually be in the ratios, financial ratios for the firm. But I did find that the common size income statement was very useful in giving me an idea of how well the company was controlling its cost for its products that it sold and and uh, controlling its um, selling general and administrative expenses. So let's go to the ratios and again these ratios are calculated according to the equations that I gave you in the set of notes and I just want to go through and discuss the trends and for some of these we're going to look at the financial statements to see what's driving this trend. So the current ratio um, went through this period of increasing. It went from 1.1, 1.3, 1.3, up to 1.5, and then fell back to 1.0. And then the quick ratio had the same trend. It went from 0.8, and it bumped up to 1.3, and then fa fell to 0.7. So we had a, a period of here of increasing liquidity on the balance sheet, and then kind of a sudden drop off in, in 2018. So let's take a look on the balance sheet as to where that came from. So we're going to be looking for the numerator, the, the value of its current assets, and for the denominator for the value of its current liabilities. A drop in the current ratio could be because the current assets fall or because, because the current liabilities increased. So looking at 
the current assets for the firm, we can see kind of what's expected here. These increased over time and, and increased somewhat dramatically relative to the sales of the firm and then had a big drop off here. So let's look at the individual categories here to get an idea of where that came from. So we had a deferred taxes were 875 and 691 and then went away in 2016. The inventory was at 31.43 and then it dropped one year and then went up three years and continued to go up and then finally restricted cash and what restricted cash is is that the firm has cash but they're restricted on how they can use that cash so that will also show up on the balance sheet but they they can't use it so those are sorry the inventory and and prepaid expenses accounts. Let's look at cash and cash equivalents. Their cash went up consistently between 2014 and 2017 and then dropped by almost um, $2 billion, about $1.9 billion between 2017 and 2018. So there was a, a fairly large decrease in cash here, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because they, they evidently had some excess cash. And really where we see where this drop off occurred in between 2017 and 2018 was right here in short term investments. So they had a lot of excess liquidity. Um, oftentimes when you see short term investments or marketable securities, that's where firms will put cash that they're not using right now um, and, and for or don't expect to need right now for uh, making payments. And so they went from $8.9 billion in short-term investments in 2017 to 272 million at the end of 2018. So they got rid of a lot of cash or near cash um, assets right there, which which may have been a good thing for Pepsi. So this this decrease in the current ratio might have been a good thing because they're getting rid of excess liquidity that they didn't need. Okay. Let's look, let's just take a look at and then here's accounts receivable. Um, those have have been fairly uh, stable throughout the five-year period uh, starts at 5.68 billion dollars and ends at 5.978 billion so not a lot to see there they increased some over time but that's to be expected because overall revenues increased during that time period the current liabilities also increased um, they went from 18 billion they dipped they went up they dipped they went up but, but in general, over that five-year period, the uh, current liabilities increased. The accounts payable increased pretty steadily during that time period, which we would, we would expect for a firm over time. Accrued expenses also increased, although it, it did go up and then down here. But overall, we saw an increase in those. Short-term borrowings, they went up and then they fell off. And, and that may have been partially where some of this cash went to pay off the short-term liabilities. This next one's called the current portion of long-term debt. And what this is, is the firm has long-term debt. A portion of that principal will come due in the next 12 months. And that's where this um, category comes from. This line item is the portion of the long-term debt that will mature and be required to be paid off in the next 12 months. So the total amount of long-term debt a firm has outstanding is the long-term debt under the long-term liabilities plus the current portion of the long-term debt, the portion of the long-term debt the firm has that will come due in the next 12 months. So in general, the conclusion that we can make is that the decrease in the current ratio and the quick ratio from 2017 to 2018 was due to getting rid of um, a lot of cash or near cash, sorry, the short term investments that the firm has. So we see an overall positive trend there or, or increasing trend over time. Um, the drop in 2018 was due to an inc um, a decrease in short term investments.
the increase over the previous four years was due in large part to that increase in short-term investments because they went from about 2.6 billion in short-term investments to 8.9 billion so that's a very large increase relative to the increase in their current liabilities which only went up over that uh, four-year period by about 2.5 billion so we saw an increase in short-term investments of 6.3 billion but an increase in current liabilities by only um, one point, again, 1.5 billion, 1.4 billion. Um, we can really see there that these short-term investments drove the increase in the current and quick ratios for that four-year time period. All right, so that's the, uh, the short-term solvency or liquidity ratios. The long-term solvency or debt management ratios, their total debt ratio was pretty stable for the time period. We saw it go from 0.75 up to 0.86 and then a decrease in 2018. Um, and, and again, my, my impression would be is that they used some of those short-term investments. They cashed those out and they paid off some debt. Uh, right here at the end. Their debt to equity ratio followed the same trend. It went from 3.02 to 6.27 and then again it fell off in, in, uh, in 2018. The equity multiplier went from 4.02 to 7.27 and then again fell off in 2018. And their cash coverage ratio and again that's that was EBITDA, EBITDA divided by interest expense went from 13.73 and it fell for two years and then it went back up and then it fell again um, in in 2018 and let's take a look at why this was I think I have a pretty good idea and so that cash coverage ratio we can see fell in 2018 and that's because well in part at least because their interest expense increased fairly dramatically in this year. Um, we can see that it went from 1.15 billion to 1.525 billion, so an increase of, I want to make sure I do the math right in my head, about $375 million in interest expense during that year um, increased the denominator of the cash coverage ratio and thereby decreasing the overall ratio. And so we can see that interest expense increased from 2014 through 2016 and then decreased and then increased fairly dramatically in that last year. Let's take a look at the balance sheet and, and see what was going on with their debt. Um, you can see in 2004, at the end of 2014 they had $23.8 billion in debt and that increased to $33.796 billion so a fairly large increase almost a $10 billion increase in debt and then it fell off by about $2.5 billion in 2018 and again I'll point to this decrease in short-term investments they had short-term investments quite a bit they cashed them out they used that to pay off the, some in, in part to pay off their debt and so we can really see that here so it appears that Pepsi converted short-term investments to cash in 2018 and use that cash to pay down debt. The equity multiplier 
went from 4.02 to 7.27, so that's a fairly large increase. So let's take a look at that too. Um, so the equity multiplier is total equity divided, excuse me, total assets divided by total equity. So if they decrease the value of equity for the firm, they actually increase that multiplier. So let's take a look at that too on the balance sheet. I'm going to go to total equity here. And so this is something odd you normally don't see with a lot of businesses. But they went from having total equity of $17.5 billion in 2014, and I'm going to stop here at 2017, down to $10.981 billion. So they decreased significantly the amount of uh, equity, that, equity that they had during this time period. And that might seem a little odd because the company was profitable. So you would expect that at the very least they're retaining earnings. Um, and, and growing their retained earnings for the firm. And that was actually happening. Uh, they went from $49 billion in retained earnings in 2014 up to $59.947 billion in 2018. So an increase of about 10, uh, almost $11 billion in retained earnings. So they were plowing money back into the company. However, there's this, um, this line here that's important. It's treasury stock. Treasury stock is a contra asset account, excuse me, contra equity account. So you see this is a negative number, so it can, can be a little bit difficult to talk about, but the treasury stock value becomes more negative as the firm repurchases its stock in the marketplace. So that, that number gets larger, although it is negative number, as the firm repurchases its stock in, in the market. So part of what Pepsi's been doing over this time period is they've been taking on debt. So you see here again the increase in long-term debt. And they've been using that debt to go and repurchase the stock. During this time period, they repurchased, well, over the entire period, they've repurchased about $9.7 billion. So that's quite a bit. $9.7 billion of their stock they went out and repurchased. And that was the value of the stock that they repurchased was about $9.7 billion. So as they're taking on long-term debt, they're using that debt to repurchase stock of the stock of the firm in the marketplace. So that was a general trend between 2014 and 2017. And then what happened in 2018 is they use the cash from the short-term investments to pay down that debt. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a picture of the financing uh, and the decisions going on there at Pepsi. Uh, comprehensive income is honestly a, a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Um, it, it can come from many different things and it, it is a whole other, other statement that you'd have to look at for that. But the main thing I wanted to show you here was what's going on with the treasury stock and the, the long-term debt of the firm and how that impacts those ratios. So that's why we have an increasing equity multiplier because the firm is taking on debt here and repurchasing its stock causing that to get larger and then, then in this last year they paid off some of their debt by taking cash from the short-term investments and, and paying the debt down. So let's move on to the asset management ratios. The inventory turnover ratio for the firm tells us how many times per year on average the firm turns over its inventory. Um, it went from 9.94 times per year in 2014 that increased for one year then began decreasing systematically over this time period uh, went to 10.36 then 9.77 then 9.39 so overall this was um, it was a positive trend here and then it's been a negative trend here so it's taking them longer to sell their goods and we can really see this in their day sales and inventory so on average how long does it take them to sell their products um, in 2014, it took 36.72 days. 
That decreased in 2015 to 34.56. It increased a little bit in 2016, increased more in 2017, increased more in 2018. Uh, so what might be driving this, this trend of an increasing um, day sales in inventory from 2015 to 2018? It could be, there, there's a few things that might be affecting it. One, the increasing um, reliance on snack foods so, and, and this is just me making some assumptions. Snack foods might take longer to sell, going from the, the raw materials to the actual sale of the, the product on a the store shelf. Um, might take longer, and as they're increasing reliance on snack foods, that might be increasing this day sales and inventory. There's other things that can affect that too. Marketing can certainly affect that, so greater marketing pushes might decrease the day sales and inventory so if they've had ineffective marketing that can cause that number to increase and this is a this is a, a little bit of a concerning trend for a company like Pepsi who should have a fairly good control over their inventory management and how they sell things um, another thing that might affect this is bottling of their product uh, many years ago uh, the Pepsi bottlers were more independent so you would have a local bottling company that was separate from Pepsi the Pepsi Corporation and what would happen there is that Pepsi would sell the um, syrup the the col cola syrup and, and pop syrup to the bottlers the bottlers would then take that syrup that they purchased from Pepsi they'd mix it in with uh, you know soda water carbonated water and put it in a bottle or a can or whatever and then they would sell it locally um, over time what's happened is that Pepsi has actually purchased a lot of their bottlers and so by by doing that they may have increased their day sales and in inventory although I don't know that that's what happened during this time period um, because before they were just selling the syrup to bottling companies so again kind of a concerning trend it may be due to and I'm just gonna do a quick quick calculation here so I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the Frito-Lay revenues to the Quaker Foods revenues to kinda of get an idea of their snack food sales divided by total revenues so this would have been 2014. And really, this has remained fairly constant. So it doesn't look like that trend has been based upon the, the mix of snack foods to um, overall revenues because it's remained fairly constant over these past five years. So we would probably be looking at something else, some other reason why it's taking them longer to sell foods. And it could just be that people aren't as excited about their products and they're moving away from the types of products that Pepsi sells. Let's move on then to the next ones, which are the receivable turnovers. So again, an increasing number here is usually a positive sign. It means that they're um, collecting their receivables faster. They go from 11.74 down to 10.82. This is not a positive trend. Uh, it means that they're taking longer to collect their receivables. If we look at the number below the day sales outstanding, in 2014 it took them on average 31 days and that was true for 2015 as well to collect their receivables. And then that's increased to 33.74 days. The difference here may not seem like a, a lot, but if you consider a company as well established and as large as Pepsi, a movement in these numbers is, is really a big deal because especially a, a negative movement, uh, you know, one that, that is not good for the company um, can signal problems because think of PepsiCo, you've got this really big company out here Last year it had $64.66 billion in sales. Okay, so a large company. On the balance sheet, they had total assets at the end of 2018 of $77.648 billion. So again, a very large company. It's kind of like an aircraft carrier. Great big ship, huge shift. 
ship because of the size of of the company it is difficult to turn that that company and move that company and so when we see a, da a negative trend for the company that can signal continuing negative trends and so it's something certainly as an analyst I would look out for for this company and I would want to know why it's taking them longer to collect um, on their receivables fixed asset turnover has been also been going down again not a positive sign um, it's taking they're generating fewer sales based on their fixed assets and their total assets uh, it's fixed asset turnover has gone from 3.87 to 3.68 and that has been a fairly consistent negative trend here and the same is true for the total asset turnover except for um, it bumped up a little bit in 2018 and again that may be because of the getting rid of those short-term investments they got rid of over eight billion dollars worth of of near cash assets and so that's actually going to decrease the denominator in the total asset turnover ratio and so that would have a, an effect of increasing the total asset turnover ratio so not these are not positive trends for Pepsi and it's something that an investor or an analyst may look out for the net profit margin hasn't been the the trend hasn't been stable for the company it's gone from 9.77 down increased again down again and again this last number here isn't fairly real isn't very reliable because it's due to this increase was due to negative a negative tax um, as a percentage of sales or negative tax in general um, as a uh, for for Pepsi due to a restructuring overseas and so I wouldn't pay very close attention to this I'd want to see what it's going to be the next year to see if there's an overall trend of decreasing net profit margin here but again not a not a great sign return on assets systematically decreasing over this four-year period going from 9.24 percent to 6.09 percent again this bump is due to the same reason that we saw before the return on equity we're going to take a dig into this um, down below but it it's actually quite high for a company like Pepsi to see an ROE in the 30s and the 40s and the 50 percent um, indicates that because this is a fa fairly stable company um, net profit margin you know with the exception of 2018 was kind of in kind of decreasing um, but fairly stable a total asset turnover again decreasing so where where these really high return on equities came from especially this increase over this three-year period was from the use of debt in their capital structure and so what we see here is the um, return on equity increasing increasing then falling quite a bit in 2017 and then increasing and that fell along with the net profit margin then increasing substantially in 2018 again because of the high net profit margin which again was due to negative taxes and um, and a one-time event overseas and and I'm gonna come back to that return on equity later so moving on to the modified DuPont analysis so taking a look in detail of where this return on equity is coming from we can see net profit margin which we talked about before uh, was decreasing for this time period overall total asset turnover decreasing during that four-year time period uh, with a brief bump up here again and and again probably due to getting rid of those short-term investments for the firm the equity multiplier increasing which I, I described earlier what was going on there and so what's happening is that the return on equity well let's just talk about this three-year period here for this three-year period the return on equity the increase here which was fairly dramatic almost almost 20 percent increase in ROE was due to increasing the equity multiplier so for the period 2014 through 2016 the increase 
in ROE was due to the firm repurchasing, uh, excuse me, issuing debt and using the proceeds to repurchase stock. During that time period, the net profit margin wasn't increasing much. The total asset turnover was decreasing, but that mu equity multiplier increased dramatically. And so that's how the firm was able to increase their equity multiplier, excuse me, their return on equity during that time period. Uh, we see, saw a drop in the ROE in 2017. So we that came from a decrease in net profit margin, a decrease in the total asset turnover ratio, there was an increase in the equity multiplier. However, it wasn't enough to overcome the decrease in these two numbers. Then in 2018, net profit margin increased dramatically, and that's for that tax reason that I mentioned before. Total asset turnover increased. The equity multiplier fell because they did pay off some debt. And so the resulting outcome of that, especially driven by that net profit margin increase, was that the return on equity was extremely high at 85.7%, which for a mature company like a Pepsi in a mature industry is an extremely high ROE. But again, one that we wouldn't expect, would not expect to continue in the future. So taking a look at the PE ratio, and this is actually a good ratio to compare to other comparable firms. I'm not going to do that in this case because, again, it's a little bit difficult to find a comparable firm for Pepsi, but we can look at this and get an idea over time how investors' perceptions have changed about Pepsi. So if we take a look here, and these are calculated by Capital IQ, and again, at the end of this, I'm going to show you how to access that. The PE ratio went from 19.88% to 21.31 the following year in 2015. So investors' perceptions in seemingly increased. However, we don't get the same consistency here. Price to cash flow actually fell quite a bit. However, the market to book ratio increased dramatically over that time. So in general, from between these two years, these two measures indicated that investors' perceptions were improving. This one indicated that they might not be. Um, for 2015, uh, 2016, uh, the P.E. ratio fell, the price to cash flow ratio increased, and the market to book ratio increased. Um, investors' perceptions increased based on the price ratios, excuse me, uh, increased based on all three ratios in 2017. And then the P.E. ratio fell in 2018 increased for the price to cash flow and price to market to book ratio in 2018. So really not a consistent interpretation across the three different measures. They all measure kind of different things. Uh, all of them do deal with investors perceptions and so they don't show a consistent pattern, consistent sign or excuse me, a consistent pattern for investors' perceptions over this time period. Different things will affect some of these, the P-E ratio and, well, the P-E ratio especially is sensitive to changes in the capital structure. An increase in debt will decrease the earnings per share, but not necessarily decrease the price, per, uh, the price very much or affect the price very much. So uh, if we are decreasing the earnings per share by taking on debt, that'll increase the P-E ratio. So that may have been some of this effect here where it wasn't consistent with the other measures. But overall, the market value measures did not indicate a sizable change in investors' perceptions over the five-year period. 
So there was no really consistent trends overall there. We can see here that between 2014 and 2017 that the dividend payout ratio increased dramatically so they were paying out more and more of their um, income. The reason why it did not increase here was because, oh sorry about that, uh, was because of that kind of the one-time effect on their net profitability of that or the profit margin of that income tax item. Um, so their their net profit margin and their net profit dollar amount was inflated in this year. And so that would be the main reason why you saw a big decrease in the dividend payout ratio. But overall, the trend for Pepsi is that they're paying out more and more of their income using um, uh, through dividends. As a result, their retention ratio is falling dramatically during this time period from 0.43 to 0.08. The ROA, well, it wasn't consistent, and I'm just really looking at this four-year period because we had that weird situation in 2018. The ROA went down, went up, then went back down again for that four-year period, as did, well, their return on equity increased consistently over the th three years here and then fell in 2000, uh, 2017. And then based on these numbers, I calculated the maximum internal growth rate. And you can see how all of these things affect that. Um, it was 4.11% in 2017. It fell to 2.07% in 2000. Um, so this is 2014, 2015, it fell by to 2.07%. And that's because there was a significant decrease in both the retention ratio and the return on assets. So we saw a decrease in their ability to grow using internal funds. It increased again in 2016 because of this increase in the retention ratio and an increase in ROA. And then it fell dramatically in 2017 because they had a really high dividend payout ratio that year. And so their ability to grow based on internal funding was very low because they didn't retain hardly any of their, their net profit during that year. Looking at the sustainable growth rate, so remember the sustainable growth rate uses ROE and the idea is that the firm maintains its existing level of debt. That wasn't the case for um, Pepsi. Uh, they actually increased their level of debt between 2014 and 2017 and then paid a lot of it off in 2018. And again, we can really see the effect of that on the return on equity And this is, well, the return on equity it was driven by net profit margin increasing in that year. And then the sustainable growth rate was really, really large. So what would come into play here is this idea that the, um, the demand for Pepsi products is not going to grow 108% per year. So really the growth is limited in 2018 by external demand on their product and not some limiting internal factor from revenues or, or funding internally. Um, this maximum internal growth rate is more in line of what we what we would expect for Pepsi uh, through that time period for uh, two to four percent um, over the long term period. And when we get into uh, asset pricing and determining the value of stock prices, that's going to come into play. We'll usually see a long term growth rate in that two to four or one to four percent range. The last item I'm going to look at on this page of ratios is the cash conversion cycle. And theirs looks kind of strange. So normally we would expect a company to have a positive cash conversion cycle. In other words, it takes longer for the firm to go from a raw material, converting that into um, a sale. So our inventory conversion, or excuse me, our day sales and inventory. So in this case, the day sales and inventory for Pepsi has been fairly consistent over time. We kind of expect that they're a mature firm. They know what they're doing. They know uh, how to, to, to make their product and to sell their product. It was 36.72 days in 2014. It was 38.86 days in 2018. So we saw a little bit of an increase there. Um, 
that can have a big in impact on a large company like Pepsi. But in general, it's fairly stable. The day, uh, excuse me, the day sales outstanding, how long it's taking them to collect their receivables is important in this case because you know, for a lot of retailers, a lot of retail firms, a lot of manufacturers, this is going to be about 30 days because that's the the um, the length of time that they would traditionally give customers to pay them. However, because it's Pepsi, because of the nature of the products that they sell, they actually get their cash much faster. They got their cash in about 10 days in 2014. Uh, fairly stable here for this three-year period and again this four-year period and then dropped down a little bit in 2018 so they collected their cash faster on the other hand in 2014 their payables deferral period was 59.91 days in other words it took them about two months to pay their um, their accounts payable and their suppliers seem to be okay with that and it's been increasing over the five-year period from 59.91 days to 89.62 days so for almost an entire month increase in the amount of time they've been um, taking to pay their defer uh, excuse me their accounts payable as an analyst this might concern me a little bit is this being driven by their ability to negotiate better credit terms with their suppliers which would be a positive thing uh, they're taking advantage of their size and their ability to negotiate to push out paying their suppliers for about 90 days or is this occurring because they don't have the ability to pay on time uh, there's some other things you would look at for this uh, for a large firm you look at their credit ratings you look at their bond ratings uh, are the bond markets getting nervous about Pepsi for a smaller firm you would look at an analyst would look at what's called their D and B or Dun and Bradstreet. rating. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet is a, a firm that looks at the payment quality and history of companies and uh, gives them a credit rating. Um, so for a large firm like Pepsi or Walmart or Apple, they have bond ratings issued by um, Standard & Poor's or Moody's or Fitch. For smaller firms that don't issue bonds and aren't large enough to be um, covered by the bond rating agencies. Dun & Bradstreet will call the suppliers and the creditors of the company. Kind of like how Equifax collects information on you from the people you do business with, from uh, you know whoever owns the mortgage on your house to whoever has your car loan to credit card companies. And they and what Equifax and those and other companies like that, Experian and TransUnion do is they use that to generate a credit number for you, a credit score. Well, Dun & Bradstreet does the same thing for small businesses. They generate a credit rating for small businesses. And if I saw this and this was a small business, I would want to look at their Dun & Bradstreet rating. And and what it's the Dun & Bradstreet report does is that you know it shows what their payment history has been with their their different creditors and indicates whether or not their credit is good so if this was a case where Pepsi is just using their size to negotiate better payment terms with their suppliers that wouldn't hurt their credit rating they're paying as agreed okay if they're not able to pay because of a lack of liquidity that they would have a bad credit rating um, then finally, the cash conversion cycle is the day sales outstanding plus the day sales and in inventory minus the uh, payables deferral period. And in this case, their cash conversion cycle has been decreasing. It's already negative. So in other words, they're generating, they're bringing cash in faster than it's taking them, than they're, they're paying it back. So they're using other people's cash as a financing source. 
They're using their supplier's cash as a source of financing for the company. In 2014, their cash conversion cycle was negative 13 days, and that's increased fairly dramatically in 2018 to a cash conversion cycle of 41 days. So they're really using their supplier's cash as a form of financing for Pepsi. All right. So now what I'm going to do, and, and let me know if you have any questions about this, I just kind of want to give you an example of analyzing a firm's trends over time to get an idea of the history and the story of the firm during that period of time. So now I'm going to access Capital IQ, and uh, Capital IQ is not something that you'll be able to get outside of uh, Washburn usually. Um, it's really a great resource that the School of Business provides to us. As a student, you can get access to it here. Let me know uh, if you would like access to it. Just send me an email. Either you already have access to it or we can, we can get you that access through the School of Business here. Um, so I just got here. I select my name. That's it. Your username on here will be your email account here at Washburn. And if you have an account set up already, and you can just go ahead and try this if you want, Go ahead and put your email address up here and username and then select forgot your password and if we already have uh, an account set up for you which for some students we do automatically set up some accounts um, depending on your major and what classes you're in you, if you select forgot your password and you have an account they're going to email you a password a, a one-time password to log in with if, if you do that and you say you know you don't have an account here shoot me an email and then I can have someone in the business office take care of that for you. And, and again, this isn't something you have to do, but it's something if you're interested in looking at this resource, I would encourage you to do. I like this resource because this is something that analysts use in the real world. Um, so it's not a, a lot of the, um, the programs and things that we offer you in universities, and not just Washburn, but, but overall, are specifically designed for academic purposes. This is an uh, this is a program that is used by professionals, by people that analyze companies and analyze investments. And so I, I really like this, being able to have this for students here at Washburn. I, I just wanted to pull this up to show you how it works a little bit. So I've logged in. You see there's a lot of information here. If I want to look at a company, I can just go up here. You can see I've looked up a lot of different companies. And I'm just going to select Pepsi because that's what I put in. And you can just you can type in any company here. But they give you a lot of information about the company. Where I got the financial statements is I went over here on the left-hand side. And I went to financials and valuation. And honestly, if you click on any of these, so you got your key stats, income statement, balance sheet, I'm going to just click on income statement it's gonna pull up the income statements and you can actually make this go for longer periods of time so if I want to just go wild with this I can pull it all of their income statements up um, for the last 30 years so it can give you a long period of time here And then if I want to, I can go to download financials. And this is what I did to create your uh, worksheet or workbook for today. I clicked on download financials. I didn't do 30 years worth, so we'll see uh, this might take a minute. And what it's going to do is actually create an Excel workbook with all the financial statements in it for this time period. All right, let's I'm gonna open that up. And so you can see here, it looks a little bit like what I have online for you, except for we have it out back to um, December of 1989. And you can see back then Pepsi was growing quite a bit every year in terms of their sales, except for they had kind of a bumpy here in, two year, here in 2000. A, a big pop in their sales right here between 2009 and 2010 and then in 2011 and they really added a lot of size to the company during that time period and then you know of course you've got the balance sheet they didn't we don't have the balance sheet for those two years there 
and so on and there's a, a like I said a lot of information out here the last thing I wanted to pull up for you was the bond rating for Pepsi and so to get that I'm gonna go over here to fixed income I'm gonna go down to credit ratings and it gives us a little bit of information here so the issue of credit rating, and this is of course going to be Standard & Poor's credit rating. They're one of the big companies. It shows here the rating date. So the most recent rating change, it was an upgrade. And it was an upgrade to an A+. So a, a good um, investment level, investment quality bond rating for, not, not the highest, but certainly a very good one for Pepsi. Um, So the idea that they're having a hard time making their, their payments, which is increasing their deferral, deferral period, doesn't seem to be the case. They have the ability to make their payments. They've just been able to negotiate better terms with their suppliers. Um, you can see here again, and I, here I, clicked, I selected the summary. They have a good rating, an A, a plus rating. And we can get an idea of the required rate of return. We're going to come back to this later on in the course but uh, the required rate of return on their debt. So on their debt that matures in 30 years, their current yield to maturity, the required rate of return on that's about 2.45%. So that's, that's pretty good. Not anything you need to know for the next exam. I just wanted to tell you that because that's, uh, that's available here. So if you have any questions about Capital IQ or the analysis, uh, please let me know. Um, on that page, on that spreadsheet we were looking at, you might take a few minutes and you can actually see how I calculated all of these. How I calculated the inventory turnover ratio, the day sales and inventory. They're all, I used the equations that are in the, uh, in the notes for all of those things. So if you want some practice on calculating those, you can certainly use the financial statements here. And then your first assignment in this class will be to create some financial statements for firms and then calculate the ratios on those financial statements. Let me know if you have any questions and I will see you soon.